I met Sally in 1952 at a party on a sort of open Sunday of singers, actors and things, and they were old friends of mine too. And there he walked in. He came straight from America where he was doing this Olivia thing. And I just took one look and fell for him, flat out, sat on the floor. He was singing. And that was it. This, when I met Sai, he gave me that photograph and I loved it so much that when I was working in a travel agency in Bond Street, I had it on the counter pinned up and everybody said, now who's that? And I said, that's my boyfriend. <laughs> and that's, I love the photograph, yeah. I was living with my mum in Hampstead and she wouldn't let him in, not having black people coming in my house. And he had, yeah, well, I did feel it because people kept looking at us in those days, 1952, we were holding hands, walking down Hampstead or wherever we were walking, you know. But in a nice way, it didn't bother me at all. I think it bothered him a bit more. He was very privileged. He came from a lovely home of his lovely parents, loads of sisters, and he was spoiled. I think he had a very lovely childhood, actually, when he was little. He was playing piano, and his mum was teaching piano, and he was very close to his brothers and sisters. His dad was a Moravian minister and they lived next door to the church and they had a very privileged, as you said, background with servants and they did have yeah. staff, they did, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> his father was his father was very famous for I mean he had an amazing congregation. So well he was very loved mm. and people came non stop. He seemed, I never met him, of course. So I met Sai's mum, she came over once. And it, it seemed very idyllic when he was little, but he wanted to get out when he wasn't little. And that's how he joined the Air Force, uh, you know. He was very well educated into black history and was always questioned, questioning, and his father did too, why he was given an education which was focusing on, on British royalty and, and not black history, really. So when he came here, what was his experience in the I Army? I think he was straight away recruited, or however you call this, and went straight into the Air Force. Yeah, that's uh, what happened. I think he was in Elsham Woods, based there. Yeah. He did a few months training and um, was hoping that he might become a pilot but then apparently because of his colour blindness was <laughs> which he, yes, he denied um, became a navigator yeah. he was flying over Holland um, where Schiphol airport is roughly based right now like that area near Amsterdam and they were attacked and the Lancaster literally blew up and he was parachuted. He parachuted. I mean, luckily, I mean, it's amazing because the hatch didn't open apparently. So I think it was a last minute escape and um, he came down in a field and was found by a Dutch farmer and taken in for a while. I think that the Dutch farmer must have got quite a surprise seeing a black officer in the middle of a field and he was taken in and sort of looked after but you know the the Dutch farmer who was sort of how should I say it put it this way they've never seen anybody but you know size color which was not black not white it was sort of you know how and uh, so they described him as what no they didn't describe him as that, that was the Germans that was the Germans but they realised that they couldn't protect him, even though they, you know, they were incredibly grateful for the British forces for for protecting them. So they tried to do their best, but realised that they couldn't keep him in hiding. So had to turn him in in a prisoner, a prisoner of war, of war camp. camp. Right. Yeah, Stalag Luft Three. 
I don't know, he was very lucky, you know, that he found his pilot. What's that's his name? True. Oh. Al Langill, that's true. He was reunited with the pilot of the, the Lancaster. A couple of the crew died. And um, yeah, they were taken there for. And he was there for two years. This silk map was issued to all the air crew covering the area where they were flying over and because it's silk and very lightweight it could be concealed in a pocket pretty easily and how he managed to keep this all the way through is quite a story the Germans described him as a prisoner of indeterminate race and took his photo, that was the headline of the paper headline of the paper, they had a photograph of him looking really rough and I couldn't figure it out, was this, you know he was always very pretty but <laughs> They didn't, either black American, you know, and, and that mixture was new to them. So it was a bit of a novelty, I suppose. So after the war, can we come to that? He did feel that he was, I don't know, that he was treated differently, I think, you know, obviously he tried, he then studied law, um, he wanted to become a judge who became a barrister, he felt that his career couldn't progress because of his colour. He found it terribly, terribly difficult hard. to be in, in the chambers with all these English people doing law, you know, he was so out of it, the whole system was against him, so he left that pretty soon actually. So he did a law degree on his own. He did qualify as a barrister but could then never find work and that's I think how he fell into show business. He was always playing guitar and he was always had a good voice and he was always playing a lot of calypsos, West Indian songs and then I think as a third program, I forget his name, a lovely producer, heard him sing and he gave him a broadcast where he sang calypsos actually and this in a way that's how it started but also he started acting and then he got a small part with Laurence Olivier to go to New York, uh, Caesar and Cleopatra with Vivian Lee. I mean he had the littlest part holding a thing, spear, you know how they did it, a black guy. He was sort of in front of Vivian Lee who didn't like it. <laughs> He was Lieutenant Green in Captain Scarlet and um, yeah, that was actually something to his well, the royalties of that one, kept him happy for quite a while. <laughs> Still no word from Commodore Goddard's plane since they hit that freak storm, sir. He made his breakthrough really, that I think, good on, on Tonight, which was a in the program 60s. that was, yeah, late 50s, early 60s where he sang a topical calypso. Every night. Turn the faces red, he suggested American blood be shed. The briefest comment to date was the president's round of 108. We bring you the news you ought to know in tonight's topical calypso. He enjoyed it, but then after a while he did it so long. He said he's not a cal... He, he, he didn't, didn't want to be stereotyped for doing that and went on to do quite a lot of other stuff. He didn't want to be, you know, I mean in his acting roles as well, he didn't want to be stereotyped. And that's what really drove him to set up in the early 70s Drum, which is an art centre for, for black people to not be given stereotypical roles and to serve sort of a forum for all the amazing black talent and plays and music and everything that would be around. I don't think there's been sufficient recognition for black people and their effort in the war. I think my dad made it his final mission actually. There's a, now a website for logging all the black Caribbean air crew that fought. Um, and I think it's only now that maybe people are becoming aware, slightly, not hugely, that black people even fought for this country.